Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. I'd like to ask you to think about what the most important things are in your life. When you sit down and really start to think about what matters, what comes back to you? For those of you with children, I imagine they come up first. Then possibly the rest of your family, your spouses or significant others, your siblings and your parents. Then if you continue down that road, you might look to your community next. Maybe that takes the form of a church or a school or a book club or a community garden or a a volunteer group. Maybe you play sports or maybe you play Dungeons and Dragons, but there is probably a group of people with which you share interests and spend time. After that, though, the things that we find important tend to get a lot more ethereal. They become less solid and venture into the realm of ideas. Things like faith and politics and ideals. Things that are important to us and play a central role in our lives, but things that you can't reach out and touch. I wonder what it would take to strip all of that away. Your identity as a citizen of your nation, your concern for the community around you, and even your concern for those closest to you. Now, for many of us, nothing could strip all of that away. Not our faith, or our love for our children, or our community. However, most of us are lucky enough never to have had that tested. We've never been put in a situation where all of those concerns are pushed aside in favor of survival. But when you read the accounts of people in history, you're often confronted with this question. You see men and women who had rich lives stripped away from them, forced into situations when all that which was once important, is dimmed. In the case of those pirates crossing the Isthmus of Panama, we see that through the eyes of William Dampier. He wrote about that experience. Now, Dampier was notoriously aloof in both his writings and in his life. His personality didn't seem to be a particularly warm one. But when things are going well in those accounts written by these pirates, we see all sorts of big talk. They're peppered with patriotic praise for England and the king, or, if they're French or Spanish, for France or Spain and their king. Then there's praise for their faith of choice and scorn for everybody else's. And then there's sort of an implicit racism. It's not overt, usually, but it's just understood that the white race stands above the others. But all of that disappears when times get tough. When these historical figures were struggling for survival, they tend to lose that innate prejudice. Those divisions between religious ideas and political motivations start to blur. A few years from now in our story, when serious tragedy strikes, we'll see that in stark contrast. We'll see Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Indian priests and even slaves who still held to their religious traditions, they'll all work together. They'll put aside their differences and work to survive. Of course, some of the pirates may have been men of faith and family that kept that in their hearts, but Dampier, who wrote our chronicle here, well, he wasn't. He was a man of science and almost never mentioned religion. Surprisingly, he never once mentions his wife back in England. He may have spent long nights pining away for her, but honestly, probably not. All of this came to me while I was reading about Dampier's account of crossing the Isthmus in the company of some of the Kuna people. These were Kuna tribesmen of dubious loyalty. There was fear and hostility on both sides, but as times became harder and harder, Dampier realized that he survived only on the hospitality and humanity of the Kuna, and he began to show a genuine gratitude and a real admiration towards them. This is episode 47, Questions and Answers. William Dampier left the Kuna plantation in the company of John Cook, Edward Davis, and a few other unnamed pirates. There were also a handful of Kuna guides. They left behind them Lionel Wafer, who was gravely injured, and four other men that they assumed to be dead. Now those four were very much alive, as it turned out, but none of our party knew that. It was a difficult, toilsome journey, but there's really little reason to relate it in depth. They crossed deep rivers and climbed tall mountains. They dealt with all manner of really pretty horrible insects and snakes and leeches and all of the dangers that you find in the Central American jungle. But mostly, they contested with hunger. Dampier relates with relish their shooting of two monkeys, which they skinned and ate. 
Now, they hated eating monkeys because they so closely resembled human children, but they were close to starving. But even that, those two monkeys, is a small sustenance for their march across Panama. Then the English were left alone one night. The Kuna left their camp, and the English were convinced that their guides had abandoned them atop a mountain to die. But the following day, the Kuna came back, and they were led to a plantain farm. They were fed plantains and yams and pork by the locals. The men were almost too weak to continue when these Kuna fed them and saved their lives without asking for anything in return. Then the chief gifted them bushes full of fresh fruits and vegetables. Without this kindness, the English never would have made it across the Isthmus. But they did. On the final night of their 25-day journey overland, the guides brought them to a village close to the sea. The men could smell it in the air. They'd come out of that swampy inland jungle and, well, they could sense the fresh air of the ocean. The Kuna village was lively, and it fed the men well. Now, this was a Kuna trading post. Essentially, it was here to facilitate trading with the English and French privateers, and the Kuna told them that they'd just concluded trading with some. There had been a fleet just offshore of some seven or eight ships carrying English and French privateers. Now the fleet had sailed on, but one Periagua had stayed behind just offshore. This must have been unbelievably good news for the pirates. They were headed north towards the Caribbean, but I wonder what exactly their plan was when they reached the coast. Of course, they'd left ships behind when they disembarked months and months ago, but those men were long gone, and the pirates here must have known it. Now, they might have planned to build canoes, seaworthy canoes, but without a suitable source of food and water, they would have been weak. Of course, a river would provide water, and if they were near the sea, they would have fish, so it was possible, even likely, that that was their plan, but a friendly pirate ship just offshore was the sort of news that must have lifted their spirits. Dampier, all along their march, had been grumbling about the route. He was concerned that where they would come out of the jungle wasn't a proper place. He thought they were taking a foolish path, and dangerously, that was essentially leading them nowhere. He spent a good amount of his time questioning the Kuna guide's intelligence and their trustworthiness. He thought they may be either fools or actively betraying them. But when he realized that they were actually being brought here, where the Kuna traded with pirates regularly, and likely they would find friends, well, I'm forced to wonder if William Dampier had a moment around that Kuna campfire with a belly full of Kuna food, where he realized, oh, wait, maybe I'm the jerk here. You see, the tone of his narrative dramatically shifts right here. But then the next day they marched to the shore and did indeed find a ship waiting for them. It wasn't large, just a single-masted periagua, but it was large enough to carry a few extra men. This was the 24th of May, 1681, and they were brought aboard the French vessel of Captain Tristain. Their first order of business was to trade with the privateers on board for any goods that would make suitable gifts for the Kuna. They needed to provide payment for their service. They wound up giving their guides knives and scissors, machetes and beads, and even looking glasses, but that was all the privateers had to trade. So the pirates, Dampier and Cook and the others, gave a half dollar each to the Kuna guides. The Kuna were elated by the payment. Honestly, it was a bit much for their few days' march, but the pirates would have died without their help, so it was definitely worth it. As it turns out, it was very, very lucky that the English did decide to give over such a rich payment. Lionel Wafer was in the hands of the Kuna, and four other men that they weren't exactly aware were alive, and things were growing dangerous for him back at that Kuna city. But more on that later. The Kuna guides marched back off to return home, and the pirates climbed aboard the French privateer vessel. Now, privateers of all stripes and all nationalities tended to stick together. There were English, French, and Dutch who all followed that same trade. There were even some Spanish pirates and a growing number of Irish, Welsh, Scottish, German, Swedish. All of these different nationalities had men traveling to the West Indies to strike it rich. Now, in general, this is a huge generalization, but those pirates and privateers understood that it was important to share a loyalty to each other, a loyalty that overlooked their traditional national allegiances. They all lived on the edge of the civilized world. They were one and all straddling the line of legality, and, well, they had a dangerous job. 
It was important to foster goodwill with people of other nations. The French took these haggard English pirates aboard because one day it might be them crawling out of the jungle in need of help, and it might be an English crew that found them. But still, that's just a rash generalization. For Cook and Dampier and Davis, all of them British, there must have been some trepidation when boarding a French ship. I mean, the English and French were historic enemies. There was conflict between them dating back to... To, to what, the fall of Rome? Generations, at least, hundreds of years. I mean, there was the Norman invasion of England. That was essentially a French takeover of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. And then there was the Hundred Years' War, and an untold number of other conflicts. Basically, if England and France weren't allied against someone else, they were probably fighting each other. And it had been two years since any of these Englishmen had been home. They'd been at sea attacking Spanish settlements, and they'd heard virtually no news. What possibly could have transpired in those years? Maybe England and France were at war, and they would receive a less than friendly welcome. Maybe the English at Port Royal had invaded and taken over Tortuga or Petit Guave. Maybe King Louis had stolen Charles' wife. Maybe England had burned Paris to the ground. All of that's unlikely, yeah, but the pirates had no idea how things stood between them and their French compatriots. Luckily, though, for everyone involved, England and France were mostly at peace. There were some strained relations after the end of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, and Louis XIV was busy making himself the most powerful man in the world, but King Charles was basically still licking his boots. There was some important news that the French had to impart, though, and that was what was happening back in Port Royal. You see, the old governor was out, the lieutenant governor had taken over, for the time being at least. Henry Morgan was in charge of the island, and had been for almost two years now. But he hadn't turned Port Royal or Jamaica into a pirate haven. Instead, he'd declared martial law in Jamaica. He'd built up the defenses to unheard of levels. Her fortresses were larger and stronger than ever before. There were more cannon across the island than there had been in her entire history, and now they had a standing militia to deal with any invading force. But, most notably, he had a strict policy toward illicit privateers. Now, if you were one of his old sailing buddies, you could get away with murder, literally. But if you were just some new young buck, well, things weren't so great. That included men like John Cook and Edward Davis. It included men like this Captain Tristane. Morgan was especially eager to catch three pirate captains in particular. He was looking for John Coxon, Richard Sawkins, and Bartholomew Sharp. See, the Lords of Trade were breathing down his neck because of all the trouble in the Pacific. Spain was furious at these Englishmen, and even though the throne insisted they acted without authority, which was officially true, Spanish governors continued to write their protestations to Morgan. Now, of course, Richard Sawkins was dead, but Morgan didn't know that, and neither did the Lords of Trade. But the real problem here was the Coast Guard of Jamaica. Under Morgan, for the first time, really, Jamaica had a standing navy. Now, there were actual navy warships in the harbor, but there was a large number of privateers who had been tasked with hunting down English pirates, French and Dutch as well, but mostly the English. Many of Morgan's old associates, these old-time buccaneers, brethren of the coast, chose to take up that hunt. It was a much safer and more reliable form of employment than hunting after Spanish gold. So Port Royal wasn't the happy home it had been for the pirates. There was less trading happening in Spanish plunder, and more and more the economy was moving towards sugar. That plantation system was in full effect, and... Many merchants chose to deal in what was a safer and more regular sugar crop than whatever contraband the pirates might bring in. Still, if you had a haul to sell, if you had taken some Spanish indigo or cocoa, Port Royal was a good option, but only if the Port Royal harbor master wasn't on the lookout for you. There were some ships that even the biggest bribes couldn't get past the docks. So for those men, Petit Guave was quickly becoming a safer harbor. So Captain Tristane allowed two days' rest for the pirates, but then he set sail for Springer's Key off to the west, where the rest of his fleet waited. There were eight ships there waiting for them. Three were French ships, under Captains Arkembo, Tucker, and Rose. 
Captain Tristane made that number four and brought their strength to four ships, about 14 guns, and 180 men. Then there was a Dutch captain, Yanke, with four guns and 60 men aboard. And then there were the English. Captain Williams commanded a small bark. A man named Captain White had a larger bark with four heavy guns. Captain Payne was in charge of a small warship of ten guns with one hundred men in his charge. And then... Well, then there was the final ship. This was also a small warship of about ten guns and a hundred men, captained by none other than John Coxon. That must have been... tense. Well, maybe not exactly tense... John Coxon was the former commander of these pirates who had just arrived. He'd been accused of cowardice and basically chased off. He'd left Captains Sawkins and Sharp to command the mission, and as it happened, things hadn't gone particularly well for them after Coxon left, but how did he feel towards Cook and Davis and Dampier? Now, John Coxon didn't leave a record behind him, so we can't ever know for certain, but we might assume that he was bitter. He had been voted out, and Dampier, Davis, and Cook had all voted against him. But they weren't his crew. They didn't owe him any loyalty. They were free agents. Two of them were even captains in their own right. To hear Dampier tell it, Coxon was actually eager to see them. He writes, quote, As soon as they knew we were come, they immediately came aboard of Captain Tristane, being all overjoyed to see us. For Captain Coxon and many others had left us in the South Seas about twelve months since, and had never heard what became of us since that time. They inquired of us what we did there, how we lived, how far we had been, and what discoveries we made in those seas. End quote. There is, hidden in that passage, a small sadness. First, Coxon had heard nothing of the pirates that stayed in the Southern Ocean, not a word. You might remember there was a party of men that elected to leave the fleet and return home after the death of Captain Richard Sawkins. Those were his men, loyal to that captain. They would have sailed north for the Isthmus and hoped to cross in much the same fashion as Dampier. But you might remember last time there was a warship at the mouth of the river of the Gulf of San Miguel. That, and there were two larger warships sailing the coast searching for pirates, and there were camps of Spanish soldiers all along the main. Then Dampier tells us how he wouldn't have survived without the aid of the Kuna. Somewhere on their voyage north, the crew of the deceased Captain Sawkins failed in their journey north. Perhaps they were just taken by a storm, or perhaps a Spanish patrol got them. Perhaps they never found the Kuna. They may have just wandered on the continent to their deaths. It's also possible that they found a village of Kuna that took them in, that they married Kuna brides and had children and lived happily ever after. But whatever their fate, they didn't make it back to the Caribbean. John Coxon hadn't heard a word of them. And then there's the other half of that news. Richard Sawkins fell in battle before his men returned to the Caribbean, or attempted to, He fell bravely and foolishly storming Spanish defenses, but remember John Coxon and Richard Sawkins were old compatriots. They sailed together on at least two voyages, and those are only the voyages big enough to warrant a mention in the official record. I suggested that they probably served together in the war, and it's almost certain that they at least worked together as privateers under French service. This would have been the moment when John Coxon learned of the death of Captain Sawkins, his old friend. But all of this brings me to a question. Both Bartholomew Sharp and Basil Ringrose villainize John Coxon. They call him a coward and a traitor and a mutineer. Of course, they did the same for Sawkins' crew and even that last group of Dampier, Cook, and Davis that broke away from the voyage. But Coxon gets it worst of all. However, here he was, captain of a warship. He had 100 men under his command. If he was a coward, well, he had rebounded from that quite well. If he was a mutineer, well, that was within his rights. He was a pirate and not beholden to stay with any other pirate crew. And here he was preparing to raid again. See, it's easy to characterize the people in this story as heroes or villains. It's easy to romanticize certain people and demonize others. I know I can be guilty of that. And if you were making a movie about this story, you would have to, right? 
Coxon might be the Captain Barbosa character. Kind of a bad guy until you understand his motives, and then he becomes kind of a good guy until he betrays the hero, and then he's the bad guy again until, at the last moment when all hope is lost, he swoops in and saves the heroes from the jaws of death. But all of that is storytelling. And let's remember here that this is real life, and, well, all of these people are bad guys. I mean, on some level, all of the Europeans in the New World around this time were bad guys by our modern standards. They were all involved in slavery and the extermination of the indigenous peoples. And those pirates that even were opposed to slavery and supported the indigenous peoples, well, they were perfectly happy to kill innocent Spaniards on their raids. There's only, like, one guy, 40 years down the line, who says, you know, hey guys, so how about we don't murder anyone or rape anyone, and why don't we free the slaves? Oh, and by the way, Indians are cool. You know, no one else in this story really fits our modern definitions of morality. Even Dampier and Wafer, who were educated, cosmopolitan men, well, they weren't exactly nice guys. So keeping all that in mind, well, everything was peaceful between John Coxon and his crew and the men who had formerly been under his command. There wasn't any animosity between them. So the English finally had the chance to learn news of what had happened in the outside world. There was some trouble afoot in England. There was religious tension back home, creating sparks. It looked to people who were paying attention like there was a civil war in the future. You see, King Charles had no heir. Now, he had at least eight children, eight children that he knew of and acknowledged, but none of them were with his wife. They were all illegitimate. Some of them would wind up creating trouble down the line, but for now, Charles named his brother as his heir. And here's the rub. James, Duke of York, brother to the king, heir to the throne, was openly a Catholic. And if he were crowned king, that would make him, a Catholic, the head of the Protestant Church of England. It was an age-old conflict that dated back to Henry VIII, and once again it was bubbling to a head. Parliaments were dissolved back in England. New parliaments were called. One minister of parliament said, quote, From popery came the notion of a standing army and arbitrary power. Formerly the crown of Spain, and now France, supports this root of popery amongst us. But lay popery flat, and there's an end of arbitrary government and power. It is a mere chimera, or notion, without popery. End quote. They tried to pass laws there in Parliament that would prevent James taking the throne, but they were thwarted. Then there was a crisis in England over what they dubbed the Popish Plot, which was mostly fictitious, but it almost threw England into armed conflict. And then, once again, Scotland and Ireland were getting all uppity. We're going to cover all of this in agonizing detail in another episode, but for now, the English learned that it was looking very much like the last day of King Charles' father, Charles I, which had culminated in the English Civil War. Now, that news would have been shared and gossiped about, but it was time to get down to business. They needed to pick somewhere to raid. Captain Wright, one of those English captains, had just returned to the quay with a large haul of Spanish flour and a few prisoners. Those prisoners were interrogated, and they told the pirates that Portobello was a poor target, since there was a fleet currently in the harbor there. So the pirates were preparing to attack the biggest prize in the New World, Panama. But with the arrivals of Cook and Davis and Dampier, they had finally some trustworthy news about the Isthmus and about Panama's strength. Dampier writes, quote, They began to be more particular in examining us concerning our passage through the country from the South Seas. We related the whole matter, giving them an account of the fatigues of our march and the inconveniences we suffered by the rains, and disheartened them quite from that design. End quote. Dampier probably also told them of the sorry state of Panama. It wasn't the golden city that Henry Morgan had raided. It was a burned ruin. New Panama was, at this point, still just a small little town, little more than a village. So the crews assembled to discuss their next move. Panama was out, but they needed to choose a target. Here we get a look at just what those meetings were like. They were a common occurrence. They happened on every pirate vessel before every pirate voyage, Every time a crew 
set out from Port Royal or Tortuga or Nassau or Libertalia on Madagascar or Boston or from their hideout in the swamps of Carolina, they had this meeting. After a crew took a ship or raided a city, they would sit down and have this same discussion. If your name was signed on to that ship's code, you got a say in what the crew did next. Now, let's be clear, not every crewman's name would be on the code. Pirates often took specialized crewmen from other ships, legitimate ships. They would kidnap surgeons or carpenters or navigators or cooks. If they needed your skills, they might just take you on board without your consent. And then if you found yourself hustled on board a pirate vessel, you had a choice to make. They would give you the opportunity to sign their code, or make your mark, and if you did, you were granted all of the benefits of a full pirate crew member. You had a vote in meetings, like this one taking place right now. You had a say in who might be the captain. You received a full share from any prizes that the ship might take. If you were a surgeon or a cook, that might be a pretty sweet deal. Sure, I'll slice onions and pour rum for a share in what the pirates bring in. It was a heck of a lot more than a cook on a merchant ship or a navy vessel would make, but, but, if the ship was taken by the navy and the crew was captured, well, if you'd signed your name, you'd willingly become a pirate. A surgeon who was forced to work with the threat of a horrible death or marooning hanging over his head had a decent argument to make in court. If he didn't sign his name, that is. If he did... Well, there was a gibbet in Boston with his name on it. William Dampier, though, had signed his name, and he sat down to this meeting and listened in. He may have put in his two cents now and again, and it's even likely that Coxon was actively asking his opinion on weather patterns and currents and the like. He was becoming quickly one of the most learned men on that subject that had ever lived. For all his writings on sloths and avocados and native customs, his main field of study was wind and weather. His findings would be used by the British for decades, and principles that he founded would be employed by the Royal Navy of the United Kingdom until the 1970s. For now, though, they were utilized by this band of pirates. So the assembled crews met and deliberated. The French among them were eager to get to work. See, they had some legal backing here. The governor of Petit Guave had sent out a man to be their general. He had a letter of mark in his possession, which allowed the French to attack any of their enemies. Now, this man wasn't actually in charge. The pirates would still elect their own officers, but he did bring a whiff of legitimacy to the whole affair. Think of him as sort of a government minister, sent by the governor to assure that everything these privateers were doing was on the up and up, and to oversee their operations. However, you'll remember that this French commission couldn't extend to the English pirates here. The English were barred from taking commissions from any foreign power. When England made peace near the end of the Third Anglo-Dutch War, their armies in Europe broke camp and went home. That left France to prosecute the war all on her own. But in the West Indies, things worked differently. England didn't have much of an official Royal Navy presence there, but they did have scores of ships commanded by privateers. When England sued for peace, those privateers were out of a job until France started handing them commissions. The forces of France were effectively tripled in the West Indies with thousands of English privateers taking French commissions, so Parliament put the kibosh on that. That couldn't continue. So this fleet of English pirates had to be a lot more selective about just where they could attack than their French privateer counterparts. Dampier writes about the sorts of decisions that took place and the factors they weighed in making their decision. He writes, quote, Then they proposed several other places where such a party of men as were now got together might make a voyage. But the objections of some, or other still, hindered any proceeding, for the privateers have an account of most towns within twenty leagues of the sea, on all the coast from Trinidad down to La Vera Cruz, and are able to give a near guess of the strength and riches of them, for they make it their business to examine all prisoners that fall into their hands concerning the country, town, or city that they belong to, whether born there, or how long they have known it, how many families, whether most Spaniards, or whether the major part are not copper-colored as mulattoes, mestizos, or Indians, whether rich and what those riches do consist in, and what their chiefest manufactures, 
If fortified, how many great guns and what number of small arms? Whether it is possible to come undescribed on them, how many lookouts or sentinels, for such Spaniards always keep, and how many lookouts are placed? Whether possible to avoid the lookouts or take them, if any river or creek comes near it, or were the best landing? With innumerable other such questions which their curiosities lead them to demand. End quote. This is a small list of the things that pirates and privateers asked every prisoner that they came across, every other pirate and privateer that they came across. You see, this crew, a few hundred men, were pooling the knowledge of all of them, and they had, due to that, relatively up-to-date information on nearly everywhere that they could potentially reach. You see, they were able to make much more informed decisions here in the Caribbean than that crew under Bartholomew Sharp had in the Pacific. They had more information, and they weren't forced to take the word of prisoners that might be dubious. After eight days, they decided on a suitable location. It was perfect. The sort of target that any pirate would covet. Probably. I mean, Dampier can't exactly remember the name of the place. See, the fleet never reached their intended destination. Their voyage was filled with treachery, backstabbing, and theft. And next time, we'll follow Dampier and take a look at all of that that happened on the voyage. And maybe, if I can be concise for a change, we'll get to his journey to Virginia and his reunion with an old friend.